Test, test, test. Ja, ja, ja. Ok. Ok, goedemorgen. <laughs> Een eerste mededeling van mij vandaag is <clears throat> dat de les in het Engels zal zijn. I don't know if there are any English students now. No? Anyways. Um, yeah, there, I noticed there are a couple of Iranian uh, students, so that's why um, I will speak in English. I trust your English is good enough to, to follow. I also trust that my own English is good enough to follow, but uh, let's see. Um, yeah, first of all, good to be physical back together. It's, uh, I'm very happy. Uh, <coughs> Let me also introduce uh, my colleague, Bavo van Kerrebroek. He will assist and, and guide the, the practical sessions. Um, but I will give you more information uh, later. And Bavo will also introduce himself um, yeah, later, on a later moment. Eh? Maybe just to ask, um, who has followed already the course uh, Foundations on Action and Perception you have? And so, um, are there second bachelors as well? Second bachelor in the musicology? Okay. We just started. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, welcome. We just announced that the English lesson will be in English because there are some, some foreign students. Um, anyways, let's start with some practical um, informations. Uh, yeah, maybe this is a bit uh, redundant as you are here, so probably you are aware uh, about this practical info, but um, a lesson is on Thursday and it is uh, divided in two parts. First, we have a lecture. So this is the lecture. Uh, here I will cover more theoretical aspects of acoustics and phonology. And the lesson starts at 8.30. So it's quite early, but uh, I'm sure you're all motivated. Now we can be physical together again. So from 8.30 to 10 o'clock, uh, the lectures here. At least for now, we will have some courses or lessons organized at the Krook, where we have uh, our research laboratory. But I will announce that in advance through the fora when uh, there is a change uh, of location. So typically, the lectures are here. Uh, you found it, so no problem. Uh, then, after we have practica, we will have a short break, of course. But um, so the practical will be guided by Bavo <clears throat> from 10 to 12.30, of course, we will we'll have a break. <clears throat> it's very close. We go together to the PC uh, locale. It's a bit further down the hall here. Um, but we will accompany you uh, the first time. And yeah, so that is the, the time and location. If there are questions, uh, you can contact us. Uh, some of you already did. Uh, don't hesitate. I think the best way of contacting is through email. And you can find uh, my email address and the email address of Bavo there. For general questions, you can contact me. Uh, also, for lecture related questions, you can contact me. If it's related to uh, the practica, then maybe it's better to contact Bavo. So don't hesitate. And don't wait too long. Don't wait uh, one day before the exam to contact us for the question. So we will have the time to, to help you as good as possible. <clears throat> Maybe also good information. It's not so visible. Anyways, um, where this course is kind of situated within the full program of art sciences. I think it's, it's good for you to, to, to have an idea about this. And so you know that the, the program, Art Sciences, is kind of subdivided in three majors. So one major, yeah, it's, it's not visible, but it's visual arts and architecture. Then we have music, and then a third pillar is theater. 
And so, of course, this course falls within the music major. And within this music major, you can make another subdivision in kind of three branches, three approaches. And one of them is more historical musicology. So dealing with mostly Western art history. Um, typical for these courses is that they focus on in kind of particularities, let's say, specific composers, you know, discussing their lives, works, or focusing on specific genres or styles or focusing on, on specific pieces. Uh, while systematic musicology focuses more on general aspects of sound and music, like psychology, is a, is a part of systematic musicology, uh, dealing with perception, so how do you perceive music in general, cognition, emotion, uh, things like this. Also, cultural aspects fall under systematic musicology. So also acoustics. Uh, acoustics deals with general aspects of sound, of music, so it's a part of systematic um, musicology. We also have a small branch of only one course dealing with non-Western music. So if we look at the, the branch of systematic musicology, so my two courses fall within this branch. Yeah, so some of you already have had um, the musical action and perception uh, part. So the third bachelors um, have already uh, done that, that, uh, that course. So it's an alternating course. Every new year, I teach the one or the other, because the second and the third bachelor are sitting together here. So then, uh, as a following course, we have music psychology, that is the third bachelor in the second semester. That is for the next semester for the third bachelors. And then <clears throat> it ends with a research seminar on music interaction in technology. So this is kind of the, <clears throat> the branch uh, within systematic musicology. So the teaching, also the research um, in systematic musicology um, is taken care of by IPAM. IPAM is the research center, the Institute for Psychoacoustics and Electronic Music, and linked to that branch of systematic musicology. I am coordinating uh, IPAM together with my colleague uh, Mark Le Mans, who is also a professor and takes care of these last two courses, so music psychology and music interaction and technology, you will get from Le Mans um, later. So we are located at the Krug. I, I think all of you know the building. It's uh, close to the site. Uh, the city library is in, but on the top floor, there are uh, a couple of research groups of UGent basically working on, on digital innovation. So IPAM is one of these groups. Um, we also have a research lab, which is situated in the basement. Uh, so you will visit it for the ones we didn't before. Yeah, maybe some, some small background of what we do at IPAM, just for your interest. Um, so we are interested in the body. How is the body involved? basically in music interaction in general. For instance, music performance, we look at body movement, we look at how musicians coordinate their movements, we look at how an ensemble of musicians coordinate their movements. And um, specifically, we want to investigate how this links or how this is related to more subjective experiences like uh, expressivity, feelings of being together. And so we try to make this link between movement, coordination, and you know, subjective aspects, to say it very broadly. So we look at movements with our eyes, but also uh, with many technologies. So this picture, um, I don't know if there is a stick somewhere here. Anyways, you see cameras um, on these tripods. You see cameras that uh, allow to, to keep track of these little markers on the body. Uh, so we can uh, very accurate in time and space locate these markers so we can track movement of body parts. As you see, this chair is on a, on a, on a fourth plate, so we can track the balance of the body. 
And of course, the piano also allows to keep track of timing, dynamics, and so on of, of the pianist in this case. My own research is focusing on uh, extended reality, so all the technologies of virtual augmented reality. I try to implement that into research, so some uh, images that gives you an idea about the crazy experience that we sometimes do. So here, it's a small musical tapping experiment, so people have to tap rhythms together, and they wear virtual reality glasses, and so we can manipulate everything they, they basically see. We can create the illusion that they are in a concert hall. We can also switch very easily how they see the other person. So you can maybe switch gender. First it's a male, with one button, press it's a female. So all, all these kind of things um, is, is virtual reality allowing. And at the same time, we here in this experiment, we, we keep track of, of brain activations. So we measure what is going on in the brain. So basically, if you switch between male and female, how does that change your uh, brain activation? It's not an actual question, but it's to give an example. And then to the right, there is an, uh, an experiment of Bavo, actually, that is uh, has just finished collecting data. It's also um, about extended reality. In this case, we animate people's movements into virtual characters, so avatars. You can see uh, on the screen on the back. So in real time, um, real persons animate a virtual twin, basically. And so basically what we investigate is how can people interact as virtual avatars. So now these two people are in the same location, but we can place each person in a different location and they interact, and they see each other and they hear each other as, a, as an avatar. Um, so that's to give you an idea about the things that we explore in, at IPAM. It's fundamental research. It's also uh, looking at how can we uh, develop new forms, new applications that are relevant for the broader uh, creative and the cultural sector. This is an example of an application that we have developed uh, together with Solvent um, for the opening of the Krug. They made a piece with this analog synthesizer and we uh, attached bicycles basically and the bicycles allowed to manipulate all kinds of parameters of the sound like tempo, fade, and so on. So an embodied social application um, Okay, that as an introduction. I don't know if there are questions uh, from your side. Just uh, raise your hand. So the topics uh, of the course, uh, more or less in chronological order. You can read the topics yourself. I try to make them uh, as relevant as possible for musicologists. But of course, we have to deal also with, uh, with the physics, especially today. Um, it's important to, to have some basis uh, in, in the physics of sound and the mathematics of sound as well. But quickly, we go to more um, yeah, applications to musicology. Then the practica. I will not say too much. I want to say, I just want to say that it, there is a change in previous years. Uh, first of all, Bavo will guide uh, you in, in the practica. Uh, I added the picture. <laughs> Bavo is often occupied in VR, so it's very likely that you see him more often on the, like, on the right picture. Anyways, <laughs> sorry, Bavo. <laughs> uh, the change is that uh, this year we will work around the central topic. So how I used to do it is give a lot of different types of software and learn you the basis um, on different topics. Uh, every software was applied to a different task, a different topic. Now we thought, okay, maybe it would be a nice idea to really focus on a, on a relevant topic within acoustics and go in depth um, in this topic. And so for this first time, we use spatial sound. It's something we specialized in, in the lab. 
And I think it's a very relevant topic in, in, in the cultural and the creative sector as well, um, especially with um, more and more applications are being developed in, in the virtual space. And so spatial sound is also very relevant to this. Also, if you uh, want to study art music in the 20th, 21st century, space becomes an important parameter. And so hopefully it will also um, sparkle your interest in that kind of music. Uh, yeah, Bavu will give you more details, but what is the goal actually is that we learn you, you we teach you digital skills to, to work with spatial sound, uh, and we will use Ableton, a software, uh, for doing that. So first we will learn you the possibilities. Um, and then one of the tasks will be that you make your own spatial work. I put art between brackets. It shouldn't be a kind of uh, artistic piece, but don't feel uh, threatened by the fact. Just it's learning by doing. Eh? Bavu will uh, learn the skills, and then um, you learn by doing it yourself. We will also organize a listening session with uh, um, a composer of contemporary music in which space is, is a, she uses space as a very important parameter in her work. Sharu Calvo, she will come and tell us a bit about her work. Hopefully it will be a nice discussion session on spatial audio. And yeah, and a last task is that you um, yeah, look up what exists in the field of spatial music, spatial art music, um, select a piece and present it to the whole group that's for the end of the semester. Yeah, the evaluation, 30% um, of the points, let's say, are uh, linked to the to the practical, so it's quite important. That's six out of 20 uh, you can earn already before the exam. Okay, so if you participate, if you contribute, if, if you hand in your tasks, it's, it's very doable. And then it's 70% exam. Typical exam. It's a it's a written exam, mostly on uh, the lectures that you will follow. Okay. Yeah. And then another new thing. Ah, what I wanted to say also is the date. It's maybe not so clearly visible. Uh, uh, but Sharu Kalvo is coming November 18. Is this confirmed? Put this already in your agenda. I got some emails of people saying, yeah, I can't follow the lessons and so on because there are overlaps. But definitely try to block November 18 because that's a once in a once in a lifetime experience you will have. Um, yeah, you can't really do that by yourself. So block it in your agenda. The same goes for um, also a new concept. I call it the immersive sessions. We have a very nice some of you know the laboratory, so it's actually uh, this one. Yeah, this is yeah. It's not so clearly visible, but um, there is a big screen. Okay. Yes, that uh, from time to time we show uh, documentaries there on the topic of of acoustics, of sound, and and sonology. So there, these are some possibilities of, of titles that, that we will show. Definitely touch the sound will be the first one to kind of uh, set it in, in motion. Um, if you have uh, suggestions yourself, please uh, don't actually make your suggestions. Eh? It's uh, meant as a kind of informal platform for students. Also researchers will be there just to hang out and, and watch a nice documentary you can so play some some uh, spatial music after or before. Uh, I will take care of some tricks so that it's, it's really a nice atmosphere for you and you see really nice documentaries. So it's not obliged. It's just an offer that we want to make to you. But if you find it interesting and you're you can come, 
you can already note these dates. These dates are really fixed. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's indeed a good question. Yes, it's in the evening, yeah. Uh, but I will um, yeah, provide you the details um, by Euphora. But it will start at 7 o'clock in the evening. Okay, informal, just. Oh, okay, then we do it uh, half acht. <laughs> That's not a problem. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, these are some references. You will find these through Ephora as well. Okay, if there are no questions, we can start with the actual lesson of today. The basics, um, yeah, that's the first lesson. Um, we will talk a bit about um, the basic components of acoustics. Um, I outlined or, or highlighted four, and so you have the sound source. We'll tell you briefly about this. Wave propagation, so how a wave travels through space. This will be, I, I will talk about this in depth. The room uh, and uh, a bit influence. There's another important component, and then perception. So four components, I will run across them uh, one by one with a focus on wave propagation. And then uh, the, the rest of the lesson actually will be, um, con um, will be uh, focusing on, on a pure tone. That's the most basic uh, phenomenon in acoustics. Not so exciting, but yet very important to understand more um, complex acoustic phenomena. Uh, yeah, we will deal with pure tones, um, how to represent them, also how to kind of uh, describe them with a formula, uh, discuss properties and parameters. So first, acoustics, what is it? Evident, it is the study of the nature of sound. So it deals with the physics of sound. The, the general physica of, of sound. Now, maybe you ask what, what is the relevance for me as a musicologist. Um, I think it's, it's very important that you know some of the basics of sound, that you have some insights in the physics of sound, because it can solve a lot of questions where musicologists have to deal with. I always give the question about the scale mi fa sol la si. Why this scale? Why, why is this scale coming in the whole repertoire of Western music? Why specifically this seven-tone scale? Well, you have the, an infinite choice of tones and intervals. I will explain that this is linked to the physics of sound, to the timbers that instruments uh, create, um, to how we hear also. So it's important to have an insight in these physics, the basics of it, to solve and to understand also more musicology or historical musicology related questions. Also systematic musicology related questions. If you want to study the responses in the brain of people to music, you have to understand the physics of sound. It's all about resonance with sound. So you have to also talk with the same words, the same vocabulary, as we do in acoustics. We talk about vibration, we talk about resonance, we talk about amplitudes and so on. So musicology needs the physics, I would say. Now, there is a problem with acoustics. Why is it a problem between uh, hyphens? Is that it's ephemeral. It, it doesn't have a real object, it's not tangible. Not like other arts, like paintings, um, sculptures, architecture. There you have an object. You can grasp it, you can see it. Sound is much more problematic in that account. It's, it's invisible. You can't see sound. You can't grasp it. Okay, with recordings you can replay it. But anyways, if sound plays, it, it, it's gone again at the same time. It's not visible, it's very fast, like frequencies go up to 20,000 oscillations per second. That's incredibly high, it's very high pitch, and it's very small, like movements of air particles it's in, into micrometers. Yeah. So that's difficult, 
also to, to get an understanding of it for you. And so what I always try to do is to, to make it visible to you, to work also with analogies um, so you're hopefully better able to, to grasp what sound is. And happy to, to show this video. It's a um, yeah, kind of phenomenon semantics. And that is the art of making sound visible through all kinds of um, instruments and, and, and uh, um, yeah, phenomena. You try to make the sound visible. And uh, one of these people that, that is into cymatics is Nigel Stanford. And I want to show um, this video, how you can make sound visible, more graspable, and really show the, the magic of sound also. It's, it's really incredible how fantastic patterns emerge um, in sound. So I'll show it to you. Okay, as an example, you can see the whole uh, video online. I will quickly look at my recording. Yeah, 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 okay.
Okay, so the four uh, important components uh, of acoustics. Let's start with the sound source. This is the, the source, the, the, there is where uh, sound is created. On the one side, on the other hand, you have the, the, the subjects, we humans, that listen <clears throat> to the sound. And in between, you have um, the propagation, what we call the voortplanting. Uh, the, the propagation of sound. So sound needs to go from the source to the target to the to the listeners. So this component of um, traveling uh, energy is is called propagation, voortplanting of of sound. Then the fourth component is the room. Uh, we will discuss that in much more detail in the, in a later uh, lesson. The room very much influences how a sound reaches the listeners, how it goes from the source to a listener. Uh, reflections and, and so on, bending of waves. It's very important um, uh, on the experience of, of sound. So let's have a bit closer look to the sound source. Basically, most of the sound that we hear is caused by oscillating objects. Sound, an object that, that vibrates in some frequency range. Uh, some of sound is also caused by what is called air vortex, uh, vortex simulations, luchtwervelingen. Uh, but most of the tones that we hear normally are caused by uh, oscillating objects. So what it does, such an object, it causes a small disturbance in the medium around. We'll discuss that later in more detail. But that is what an, os an, um, an oscillating object does. It, it kind of disturbs the surrounding medium. To visualize, yeah, the vibration mostly you can't see it. It's so tiny, it's so fast, you can't see it. So here, I slowed it down and I zoomed in. So you can see the vibration of a tuning fork. Also the disturbance of the medium, normally, typically, it's air, you can't see it, you can't see air particles. So here, um, water is used to, to see or to have a more clear grasp on this disturbance of a medium. Also look at very closely to the water and you see wave forms. It's not, no, it's not so visible, but uh, anyways, I will put the videos online as well. See here, it's kind of visible. So vibration causes disturbance as the, the source of sound. The speaker, it's also a sound source. If you slow it down a bit, you can also see more clearly <coughs> the vibrations. So these were oscillating objects. I also talked about uh, vortices, so luchtwervelingen. An example of this is um, um, a flute. Here it's a, a block flute. I don't know how to say in English, but basically what happens is uh, you have a um, yeah, a jet of air coming in, and this jet of air kind of splits on a, on a sharp edge. In the case of a flute, it's called a labrum. And the air um, is kind of split, and it, it creates a vortex, a, a, a vortex circulation and luchtwerveling. And so this also causes a disturbance in the surrounding air. And so this creates resonances in the, in the tube of the flute, and this leads to an, uh, an audible tone. We also, in the next course uh, lesson, we will go into more detail about this. So now let's uh, turn to uh, the propagation of sound. And good to know the propagation is happening through waves, sound waves. Now, it's good to, to start to make a distinction about different types of waves. Uh, we have two types, and I always refer to an example of, um, of space. 
let's imagine that we are on the moon. If I would talk, would you hear me or not? So what do you think? If we were on the moon, in the space, in outer space, would you hear me when I talk or not? No? Why not? No? No? Exactly. There is no medium. There are no particles. So mechanical waves, so sound is related to mechanical wave, requires matter. In space, there is no matter. There is a vacuum. And so uh, sound is not able to travel from the source, me, to you, the listener. So that's a, an impor important first <clears throat> type of wave, a mechanical wave. We go into more depth. The next type of wave is an electromagnetic wave. And if you're on the moon, can you see the sun? What do you think? I see some nodding, yes. Yeah, indeed, you can see light. Light is also a wave, but it is an electromagnetic wave. It's not a principle. And I'm not going into detail. Because honestly, I also don't know the details of electromagnetic waves. It's a very complex uh, phenomenon. Basically, what happens is you have charged particles, photons, electrons that spin, they oscillate, and they create a corresponding oscillating electromagnetic field. And this field radiates waves. Okay, more you don't have to know. It's a specialty on itself. And so you have different types of electromagnetic waves. We come across them a lot, from radio waves, and bands, and so on, microwaves, uh, also um, the waves that are sent by your remote controller of your television, and so on. So very useful, but nothing related to sound, actually. Well, nothing is maybe a bit too exaggerated, but it's a different type of wave, at least. So let's look at the mechanical wave. So the question here is how is energy transmitted from the source to the listener? One possibility would be that the matter displaces from the source to the listener, as I show on top. And that's a bit how a bullet works. So you have a gun. The gun gives energy to the bullet, and the bullet goes from point A to point B, and it kind of brings this energy from point A onto point B. This is a possibility, but this is not how sound works. With propagation of sound, eh, the transmission of energy, there is no displacement of matter. Matter stays as at its place. Eh? You have particles, but they don't go from point A to point B. They do move but they oscillate around in equilibrium. If you look at the netto movement, there is no displacement. It just uh, oscillates around a steady point. Now, what is happening is that particles give energy from the one to the other. So it's a kind of domino effect. That's, again, an analogy to, to make it more graspable. If you look at the domino play, that's how you should imagine how sound propagates. And so the little blocks, they don't move, but they pass their energy from the one block to the other. Definitely this one, this last, is very interesting to, to grasp a, a sound wave. Yeah. So particles stay, but they give their energy from one block to another in a kind of front, a wave front, they pass energy. <clears throat> this is another example. It's a Mexican wave. It's uh, not really related, but it's just to show you uh, the idea of a wave can propagate without matter displaces itself. And so people are all sitting on their chair. They stay on their chair, but the wave is really going through the whole stadium to show how sound propagates. So within this mechanical type of waves, you have a subdivision. You have what, what is called a transversal wave and a longitudinal wave. 
And what makes a wave transversal or longitudinal is uh, related to the direction of uh, the source, so the direction of the oscillation of the source in relation to the direction of the propagation of the wave. Yeah. Let me explain. The transversal wave, the source, is perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Yeah. As an example, it's also not so visible, but uh, an example of a rope. So you attach a rope to the wall. You need source to get the wave going, and the source is your hand. You see, the source oscillates in a vertical way, while the wave is traveling in a horizontal direction. And so the direction of the source oscillation is perpendicular, start loodrecht op, the direction of the wave itself. When that is the case, we call it a transversal wave. Another example is, for instance, if you throw a stone in water, yeah, so the, the source, the stone, is going in a vertical direction, the wave is going um, in the horizontal direction. Now, sound is not a transversal wave, sound is a longitudinal wave. There, the direction of the oscillation of the source is the same as the direction of the wave that it causes. Then you have a longitudinal wave. This, as an example, it's not sound, but it explains and shows to you um, the idea of a longitudinal wave. You see, so you have a spring, you have a small oscillation, just one cycle, you disturb the medium, you create a kind of more dense, you kind of compress the spring, and this disturbance travels throughout the whole string. Uh, spring. So this is also how you can imagine how sound propagates through space. So now what is the medium? We have all kinds of medium. Sound travels through this bench. It travels this telephone. That's a medium. It, it can kind of uh, transmit sound energy. But most typically, how sound reaches you is through air. Okay. So an air there is no such thing as an air molecule. Actually, air is consisting out of a mixture of many kinds of molecules. And so different types of, of molecules. Um, one of the most present molecules in air is N2. That is nitrogen, stickstoff. And you can't see, but this room is filled with N2, with uh, nitrogen. And so these are the molecules that are very present in air. Also oxygen, O2, still 21%. It's oxygen, depending on temperature, of humidity, and so on. Um, this, this balance. And then you have some, some rest fraction of, of other molecules, um, also water, vapor, and so on. So these are, this is the mixture of, of molecules that make out air. So these are the particles that uh, transmit energy, sound energy, from me to you. Now, you can't see, but they are filling the, filling the, the space, and they have their own place, let's say. Okay, they move, but they are in rest. If there is no sound, there is a kind of normal air pressure. The particles are in an equilibrium. In a balance, whenever there is sound, so you bring in a vibrating object, an oscillating object, you create a disturbance, okay, you bring these particles out of balance, and the domino effect is going to take place. And so one particle will bump into the other, and so the, the energy will be transmitted from particle to particle. Now, how fast this wave travels depends on how uh, close these particles are together. And that's different from medium to medium. Also, it's different within air, depending on temperature, depending on humidity. So that would also have an influence on how fast a wave travels. Typically, if you have a solid medium, like a board or, or anything else, particles are more close together. Yeah, and so sound will travel faster. Okay, in gas, particles are a bit more 
uh, far from one another. So in gas, uh, the wave will travel less fast. Here you can see in the solid, it's much faster. In air, typically, again, it's an average. It is about 343 meter per second that a wave is traveling. That's an average. Okay. So here is another visualization. On the left, you see a, a black bar. This is the oscillating object, and all the dots and here you can see how a wave travels throughout the medium. So we call it a traveling sound wave. In Dutch, it's a lopende golf. If you want to look for more information, a lopende golf. So look very closely what is happening. The oscillating object pushes object, uh, particles together to create a kind of compression. Um, and so, again, that domino effect, eh, the one particle pushes the other. And what you get is a kind of traveling wave front, eh, like the, dense, the density that is created by the oscillating object travels throughout space. These red lines indicate like the regions of high density of particles, and we call that a wave front. Now, Oh, it's not so visible. Anyways, if you look at how uh, the densities are uh, distributed in space, you see that some regions in space have a high density, high pressure. Particles are squeezed together. And that regions we call compression. These are compression regions, so high pressure. But again, they travel. Eh? They are not static. On other regions, eh, we have... Uh, very thin um, particle. Yeah. yeah, maybe a bit. <laughs> yeah. So where uh, there are not a lot of particles, so the density is very low, that we call a rarefaction. That's terminology. It's a kind of so, um, so you have an alternation of compression areas and rarefaction areas. Now, this is quite linearly represented. This is not how it is in, in, in actual uh, life, let's say. A sound source typically emits in all directions. It's a kind of spherical wave front. So it goes in all directions at the same time. Now, this is not yet spherical because it's uh, a bit difficult to represent, but it's, it's already circular. It's already a better idea of how, of how sound travels through air. Yeah, so you, you see circular wave fronts expanding and traveling in space. Quite psychedelic uh, image. Again, so the, the red lines are called wave fronts. So locations of high pressure, high densities, and the domino effect makes that they travel throughout space. And this last one to end the propagation component is a visualization just showing that there is no displacement of air particles. I know I repeat myself, but here in a visual way. Yeah, so the wave is traveling, but an individual particle, let's look at the blue one, is really staying at its own place, going back and forth around an equilibrium point. OK, then let's look at another important component in acoustics. We will not deal with it here, because that's the topic of the other course, the foundations of action and perception. But I will, uh, anyway, touch it here very briefly. So perception. So you have the wavefront coming from an oscillating object, and this wavefront is coming to a listener, and in the end, it hits the ear. It comes in your ear canal, and it kind of hits 
the, the eardrum, and the eardrum starts resonating accordingly, according to the, to the wave fronts that are coming in. It's a uh, quite um, also a magical system we have, eh? the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear, very small, very ingenious how, how it all works. But again, I will not discuss it too much here. Um, the ear is sensitive only for a specific frequency range. So it hears from objects that oscillate at 20 hertz, so 20 oscillations per second, until 20,000 oscillations per second. So the low number, 20 is a very low tone, 20,000 is a very high pitch. So Low and above, you can't uh, perceive uh, vibrations in the air, basically. So it's a domain of psychoacoustics. Uh, again, I will not deal with it. I can show you an animation about uh, the mechanics of the of the ear. So very enlarged. So vibrations are putting onto an oscillator system, the hammer, and then it kind of um, puts the energy, the vibrational energy, onto the graph, and there is a, um, a transfer from mechanical energy to electric energy, basically. That's content for another course. Also, microphones. Just briefly here, it actually works like our ear. It also has a, a small membrane, like an eardrum, and the microphone is sensible to uh, changing uh, air pressure, basically. So it captures the variations in air pressure that a sound causes. This we will deal with in, a, in another lesson, in this course. Okay. So the four components with the focus on propagation. Is it clear for you? Yeah. It's, I, I don't think it's new information for you. It's just a kind of um, recapitulation of, of what you already know. And then let's go to another basic phenomenon. The most basic phenomenon, let's say, in acoustics is a pure tone. Like I said, nothing spectacular, not so interesting, yet very important for you to, to really understand what it is and, and understand also the physics of a pure tone because it provides a foundation for a more complex phenomena. To understand tones, for instance, you need to know what is a pure tone because basically a timbre uh, is built up from individual pure tones. Also, to understand room acoustics and so on, it's, it's very important that you understand the concept of, of a pure tone. So we will uh, discuss some characteristics, some parameters, and some ways to describe a pure tone and how to represent it to, in the end, come to a formula. A very important formula. It's, you don't have to know a lot of formulas, but this formula you really should know by heart because it's the most important formula in acoustics, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. I say it's not interesting. It's also, from a musicological point of view, not so interesting. But um, it's, sometimes it is important. For instance, if you look at uh, 20th century, 21st century music, electronic music, electroacoustic music, there are quite a lot of experiments that inspired by that pure tone. I refer here to uh, a piece by Stockhausen, 31. This is actually inspired by uh, the pure tone. And so he explores one of the first works, and he really explores pure tones, how you can combine them to create timbres. And his interest is really that to create timbre on the basis of pure tones. And it's, of course, very much in line with his, his idea of serialism, of his organization of music. Um, he did it before, 
organize pitch, organize rhythms, but to organize and to control timbre, that was really something, a parameter in the music, which was, was very much not easy to do, to control timbre. And working with pure tones, really, we thought, give them the, the potential to, to create any timbre possible and to control any timbre he would like to, to produce. That's why um, yeah, he was interested at that time uh, to work with, with pure tones. Anyways, it's an, quite an interesting article if you want to uh, read more about it. He also worked uh, together with Karl Huyvaerts, which was connected also to IPAM, and so he kind of links to our institute somehow, <laughs> with some imagination. Yeah, the pure tone, um, let's make one. So this is a software you will learn to use uh, with Pavel. Uh, basically, it has an object, a cycle object it calls. Is it readable? No, not so much. And this creates a pure tone. Now, of course, you have to indicate what frequency you want. And that's a little cable. You put a cable into the cycle object. You can also change the amplitude. And then you need speakers. Let's put like this. And then. Okay, the frequency is now zero. That's why you don't hear anything. <laughs> and then we go up. So from low. So, and that is a pure tone, like I said, in itself, not very spectacular. So frequency, you can also change the amplitude here. So very easy to synthesize. So you can set the pitch, so based on the frequency, and you can set loudness with the gain. So here already the first parameters of a pure tone. Now, how we will describe it? We will use a concept, namely the concept of simple harmonic motion. So you can understand a pure tone by this concept. We can also synthesize pure tones by a simple harmonic motion. So an object that vibrates according to a simple harmonic motion creates a pure tone, as simple as that. So it oscillates, it's a back and forth movement, it's harmonic, it relates to a pattern that is periodically repeated, and it's simple, simple referring to the fact that it kind of creates a sinusoidal shape, but I'll come back to that later. So again, visualize it. Um, what is the movement that, uh, for instance, speaker membrane does when it uh, goes into a simple harmonic motion? It's difficult to see. Also, the movement that an air particle makes with a pure tone is difficult to see. That's why this example, it's a spring again with a mass, eh? a veer massa system. You bring it out of balance, you disturb it, and then you got the simple harmonic motion. That is the motion that a tuning fork, a particle on a tuning fork, or an air particle makes. So let's look at it from this perspective. So we have some parameters. An important parameter is a period. And what is a period? The period is the time that is needed for the particle to uh, make one oscillation. So you start at an equilibrium point, the middle, like now, you go to the right, you go to the left, and you come back to the equilibrium point. That is a period, that's the time for one oscillation that we call a period. You express it in seconds. Another parameter is frequency, and that is the inverse of the period. Uh, so that indicates how many oscillations you have per second. And it's expressed in hertz. Uh, like we are sensible from 20 hertz 
20 cycles per second to 20,000 hertz, 20,000 cycles per second. Important, so you can take the inverse, so the period, if the, so 20 hertz, if you have 20 hertz, So that is the frequency. Then you also have the period, namely 1 over 20 seconds. That is the period. So that's what I mean with the inverse. So 20 hertz, 1 over 20 seconds. So from hertz to seconds. It's important for the formula that comes later. Um, a second or third parameter is amplitude. This is the... Yeah, the uh, how, how could I say, uh, the, the maximum displacement of the particle. So a sound that is perceived as loud will go much more to the right and much more to the left. A soft sound will not have uh, a very big displacement. So it defines the perceived loudness. Important parameters. Now, how can you represent a simple harmonic motion? First way of representing it's uh, an abstraction of, of that movement of the simple harmonic motion. Nothing it's nice, but you can't really do a lot with it. What it shows is so the starting point, so a point in balance, a particle, the position of the particle under rest, let's say, at equilibrium. And then what is shown is the displacement. Yeah, so here you have a value from minus 1 to 1, but this indicates the displacement of the particle. So one dimension, nothing spectacular, visually interesting, but you, you can't really do a lot with it. A second way of representing is a two-dimension two representation. We add time. So we have the same idea. Uh, visualize the displacement, but we add a vertical axis which indicates time. Okay, so while it oscillates, you pull it to the right, and then you get this nice sinusoidal shape. So I indicated time as a function of the period. So after one period, one t, you have had one oscillation. So go all the way up, all the way down, and back at equilibrium point. So one t, two t, two oscillations. So it gives you already a bit more information, gives you a nice shape, but again, you can't really do a lot of it. You can't calculate or anything. So, so we need to, to have something different. Yes, this is a, a screenshot of Audacity, a software program. You can uh, generate sign tones, and basically what you get is also displacement as a function of time. This is the, the displacement of a speaker membrane. It's a waveform. Now, we go to a third way of representing, and here I use a circuit. So a circle is a very, very interesting tool or instrument if you have to deal with things that repeat themselves. So periodically repeating phenomena. A circle is, is, is your instrument to, to use. And sound is, to some extent, periodically. So we use here uh, the circular representation. I'll show how it goes. So to the right. Uh, now you get a rotating vector. It rotates and it does one rotation per period. So that's already the second round and it turns around again and after 3T it comes back. Also, you can note that it expresses also the displacement. If you uh, project the, the the vector, the rotating vector, perpendicular to the vertical axis, like then you get the displacement. So it captures uh, time, the period, 
it captures amplitude, the length of the vector, and it captures, in a way, also displacement. OK, so very interesting um, to calculate with also. So that's the representation um, on which we will elaborate a bit more. Another important concept or parameter here is the phase. And the phase actually refers to the angle that this rotating vector makes. So let's say that the horizontal axis, it's difficult to show, maybe I will. So if you have the circle, you have the x axis and you have the y axis. OK, and so the phase is the angle that the rotating vector makes with the positive x axis. Simple. So it also indicates the, the position within that oscillation. OK, so it's an angle, but it refers both to time and also displacement. Often you also see phi, so phase is, uh, is using the, the Greek letter phi. Uh, phi zero is actually the angle at the start. That's something you see quite often in literature also. So I mention it here as well. Now I said it's uh, very handy to calculate this circular representation. Uh, you can do a lot with it. Uh, also, if you want to uh, grasp more complex phenomena terms and so on, uh, you need to calculate somehow. And so the circular representation really provides a basis um, to calculate. And what we will now do is to, um, to elaborate this circular representation into a formula, uh, an important formula, as I said. And the idea of the formula is that we give it the frequency and the time, and the formula will calculate for us the displacement. For instance, this is very important if you want to synthesize a pure tone, what I did in, in, in the software. I indicate which frequency do I want, and of course the time from the moment I switch on the, the audio um, time is running. So frequency time as input, and spits out the displacement. So we need the idea of the circular representation to make that formula. And the essence is that the sinus of, the angle of this circular or this uh, rotating vector gives you the displacement. This is the basic idea. So you connect the angle to the displacement. OK. Now let's break it up. Yeah, the angle, yeah, yeah, that is actually the end point. There is where I want to end. And now I will explain how, how, it, uh, how we get there, let's say. But to, to important here is that there is a connection between the angle and the displacement. And to say even a bit more at this point is the relation between the angle and the displacement is actually the projection of the vector into the y-axis. Anyways, we'll come there. So, two steps we have to take. First, we have to calculate the angle in a circular representation. Yeah. Yeah, the displacement is uh, kind of the instantaneous position of the particle, the amplitude is the maximum displacement. Um, so the, the displacement, you can uh, it changes from, from moment to moment, while the amplitude is, is a constant, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, it's an important uh, question, actually. Yeah. So two steps. First, we calculate the angle in the circular representation. So we have the frequency, we have the time. If we have the frequency and if we have the time, we know the angle. Okay. So the higher the frequency, the higher the vector will rotate. That's step one. And then we, we need that projection of which I spoke. So we take the sign of this angle. The sign that it will give us is the projection 
on the rotating vector on the vertical axis. But again, we come to that in a moment. So two steps we need to go through. Calculate the angle and then take the sine of the angle. Okay, so I said that circles are very powerful instruments in, in mathematics, especially if you deal with uh, periodic phenomena. And if you talk about circles, you have to talk about pi. Not the cake, you need to eat that, uh, the, the irrational number pi, 3.14. You, you all know the number. And what is pi? Hey, pi uh, is actually um, describing a relationship between a diameter of a circle and its circumference, the omtrek. It comes from the Greek peripheria, and that means the circumference, like the, the omtrek. So that's the origin of pi. So pi describes that relation between the diameter and the circumference, and the formula is very easy. The circumference is equal to the diameter multiplied by pi. Okay? So the omtrek is the diameter mal pi. Now, in our representation, we work with what we call a unit circle. A unit circle is a circle which has a radius of 1. So, if I show it here, from 0 to 1. But of course, for the formula of the circumference, we need the diameter. So the diameter of a unit circle is 2. So the circumference of a unit circle is 2 pi. Is that clear? Yeah, so the diameter is 2. You add it to the formula. Yeah, so the circumference of a unit circle is 2 pi. Okay. Quite important. Now, the rotating vector rotates in the circle once per period. So one rotation per period. So this describes 2 pi. So it goes 2 pi, it goes all the way around per period. And that is what I wrote at the top, the basis of the formula. So 2 pi is covered per t. I also have to say, um, Radians, that is uh, a way to describe an angle. Okay, so it's an alternative for degrees. So you can say my angle is 180 degrees, but you can also describe an angle in radians. And that idea of radians um, uh, works with, that, uh, with the pi. Okay, so this angle, so 360 degrees, is 2 pi radians. This angle, 180 degrees, is equal to pi. 90 degrees is equal to pi divided by 2. Is that clear? You see, you can express an angle based on pi, knowing that a whole rotation is 2 pi. So we know the rotation, the vector, covers 2 pi per t. Now, that's interesting that we want to know the instantaneous angle. So at each time, we want to know the angle. So you can add the little t to the formula, which is the, the, the instantaneous time. We want to know the angle at a specific moment in time. And little t indicates that time of which you want to know the angle. So let's say that t is 1. That means if t is one second, then the angle is 2 pi. Okay, so if the big t, the period, is one second, after one second, your angle is 2 pi. If your little t is half a second, what is your angle then? Okay, so this one second, where are you after half a second? Here. Okay. A quarter of a second, you're here. Okay. 
So that's what is added to the formula. 2 pi over t multiplied by the instantaneous time. So then you can calculate the angle for each moment in time. That's very handy. Now I said t is the inverse of the frequency. So you can replace the t by frequency. So it's the inverse. I said um, t or f is equal to 1 t. So in this last step, I replace uh, t with f. Okay? And that's it. That was the most difficult mathematics of the course. <laughs> What is now possible? You have f, you, ha you can bring in f, you can bring in t, and you know the angle. That is what, what is so handy about this formula. You can input the frequency, you can input the time, and then you know the angle. That's our first step of our formula. We will input f, we input t, and we get the angle. Where is the rotating vector? It's evident if the frequency is higher, eh? the rotating vector will uh, rotate faster. Yeah? So the angle is really a function of, of the frequency and the time. Now the second step, yeah, from angle we have to go to displacement. And now here we refer to sine and cosine. That's also something you will definitely remember uh, from secondary school. The sine and the cosine express the relationship between the sides of a rectangular triangle. That's basically what a sine and a cosine is doing. So if you have an angle, phi, there, the sine describes is, is actually the, the proportion of the opposite side relative to the hypotenuse, the schöne Seide. So that is the sine. So it expresses the relationship of the opposite side with respect to the hypotenuse. The same with the cosine. But here, it's the relationship between the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. Okay, as a concept, sine, cosine. This is a small example. You have to do it by yourself. We give you the phi expressed with the help of pi. Here we have an angle of pi divided by 4. Pi divided by 4 this is actually this angle. And I ask you, what is the length of y? So the opposite side. We refer to this formula. So the sine of phi is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. In the formula, we bring in all what we know. So we have the phi, we replace it by two divided by 4, and we know the length uh, of the hypotenuse. It's 1, you calculate, and in the end, uh, you know why. It's the sign you need to calculate. You can't do it by heart. Yeah, but uh, given these, uh, these parameters, phi and hypotenuse, you can calculate why. Okay? Now, let's add this rectangular triangle into a circle. Yeah. We know that if we have the angle and if we have the hypotenuse, we can calculate the y, the opposite side. Okay. In a unit circle, we know the hypotenuse. Is there, it's, it's the straal, the, the radius. It's 1. Yeah. So it's actually the same as here. We have the angle. We have the hypotenuse, so we can calculate the y. And this y, this y is actually the same as the projection on the vertical axis. This is quite crucial. Okay, so this is the perpendicular projection. And what is this? What is this? The displacement, yes. Okay, so by using the sign, we first calculate this side, but this side is equal to this side. Okay, so the sign is really nice because it can maybe transfer from an angle 
uh, do a displacement. That's the, the nice thing about working with science. So now let's go back to the formula. So we wanted uh, frequency and time as input, and we wanted displacement as output. Now we add these two steps together. We had the 2 pi multiplied by frequency by t. This gives us the angle. And the sign of this angle gives us the displacement. OK? So this formula now allows to input frequency to input time to get displacement. OK? It's a very important formula. Is it clear for, for you? Well, you have to probably you have to sit back and look at it again. But it, it makes sense. I'm sure if you go through the slides, you will, you will get the point. I would also recommend to, to really uh, put it on paper and hang it above your bed because it's uh, really a, <laughs> a, a nice and an important formula. Uh, be prepared for the exam. <laughs> no, no, it's a joke. Um, now let's go back to our uh, software to, to synthesize pure tone. Actually, what it does, this software, is implement this formula that we just came to calculate. Okay, this cycle object is actually in the back, just running this formula time after time. Okay, so you give it the frequency. Okay, so you saw me giving and changing the number, adding it, giving it the frequency. And then the software calculates very fast, very rapidly in time, um, what the displacement of the speaker should be. Yeah, so to give you an idea, the T, uh, every, well, it, it calculates uh, this formula 48,000 times per second. So the T goes in really small steps, and at each new step, you calculate the displacement, and that you send to the speaker. Okay, so that's what, what that cycle object does, given the frequency, and then calculate very rapidly in time what the displacement at that time of a speaker should be. So that is to give you more insights on in the synthesis of, of a pure tone. Yeah. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, it's by heart. But uh, so you have the frequency is equal to uh, forty-eight thousand. So you calculate the formula forty-eight thousand times per second. So the 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 t you calculate it each. Uh, so you press play, and then t is equal to zero at the time of your press play. And then the next time the formula is calculated is after seconds. And then the, the, the next time this formula is calculated is, is the same thing, but multiplied by 2, multiplied by 3, and so on. So time is actually what the computer... Uh, yeah, it's based on the clock of the computer and, and at very time, very tiny time instances you calculate. No, 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 indeed. Yeah. Frequency, you have to give in yourself time is just time. Yeah. Now to wrap up things, um, just to say that this simple harmonic motion, uh, now we talked about one. Um, either on a membrane or on, on an air particle. But actually, um, the room is filled with particles, so all these particles um, make this simple harmonic uh, movement. Now, if we look back at the traveling sound wave, yeah, you see how all these particles make this simple harmonic movement. Now, an important parameter here, yeah, if we look back at this traveling sound wave, is the parameter of wavelength. Now, what is wavelength? 
wavelength is actually the, the distance that a wave covers in one period t. And let's have a closer look. So particles are in balance. You have the disturbance. The sound wave starts to travel. Okay, it goes all the way to the right. It goes back to the equilibrium point. Now I look to the first uh, particle. Look at the movement of the first particle. So it gets completely to the right, com goes completely to the left, and then it comes back for the first time in the equilibrium point. So one oscillation, and you see that the sound has traveled a certain distance. This distance covered in one period t, we call the wavelength. And again, this is depending on the medium. It's also dependent on the frequency. Okay. So I added this square box. If you have the range of frequency from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, so the frequencies we are sensible to, then you have a wavelength ranging from 17 meters. So a very low tone has a wavelength of 17 meters. A very high tone of 20,000 hertz has a wavelength of only 17 millimeters. So also an important concept. Well, yeah, well, the amplitude you can see, and it's actually the maximal displacement to one side. So let's go to it here almost. This would be the, the amplitude. Okay. It's positive, and you also have it in a negative way, which is the same distance. So it's the maximum displacement of, of a particle in reference to its original equilibrium point. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you can also describe it differently if you look at these uh, succession of compression regions and rarefaction regions. A wavelength is also the distance between two regions where the air pressure is similar. Uh, for clarity, I now indicate the region between two uh, regions of high pressure, uh, so the region between two compressions or the regions between two rarefactions. This is also um, the wavelength. And the third way of describing it is looking at the simple harmonic motion of uh, particles. Uh, now, it is visible, I think. So two red dots are indicated. Look at their movement. What do you see? The red particle? Can you describe what you see? What is their relation? Yeah, you see that you... Can you describe it in words? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at each time they have the same displacement. Right? They, they have the same phase. Okay? And so a wavelength can also be described as the distance between two particles that have the same phase, the same instantaneous displacement all the time. Like you indicated with your hands, they are really in phase, we call it. That's also a way of um, describing a wavelength. Now, if you're really interested, but I'm not going into this, um, you can go to the formula of a traveling wave. And you see it um, implements that idea of simple harmonic motion. But it, it extends it so you can calculate the, dis the, the displacement of all particles in space. This is quite, uh, it seems quite difficult, but it's actually quite logical. I will not go into detail. If you're really interested in, in, like, interested in the art of circles, I would really um, yeah, advise you to, to go into it, but for here it's not really required. Anyways, to end, um, I would like to stop
uh, indicating and, and going a bit further on the notion of phase, of in-phase and, and not in-phase, it's an important concept. Phase difference. Now we worked with pure tones only. If we work with multiple tones, then it can be that different tones have a different phase. Okay, so we will see that in later courses. So the concept of phase difference is an important one. What is the difference in phase between two oscillations? And to end and to illustrate it again, I uh, have included a little movie that indicates that um, idea of phase difference. They're moving in phase. The same displacement at any time. Out of phase, they don't have the same displacement. Interesting. The effect is actually through the movable platform that they kind of communicate and get into the same phase. Just to show uh, the concept, this is the last slide, um, the end of the lesson. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, I, I think the experiment works with uh, metronomes who have exactly the same pace and ones that have a small different phase. Maybe Bavo knows. Uh, no. No. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a huge bunch of literature on this effect. It's actually one. It's it was um, found by Huygens. Huygens, I don't know the the, the Dutch physicist um, who found it by accident. He had two uh, clocks like uh, Slande Klokken, uh, and suddenly he saw if I attach them to uh, the same beam. They start to get into sync, and, and that is the yeah the basic finding that that all the synchronization literature refers to this experiment here in a funny in a funny way. Okay, uh, questions? If not, um, yeah. So the mathematics was a bit rough, maybe, but I'm sure if you have it a, a second look, um, I'm sure you will get it. I hope. If not, contact me and we can uh, explain it again. Uh, now, uh, let's take a break. Um, and then let's move to the PC class where the practical will take place. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. 15 minutes. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. So we see each other 20 past 10. Yeah.